huge. Huge. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Islands. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream border. This land was made for you and me. I roamed and rambled. I followed my footsteps from the sparkling sands of your diamond desert and all around me a voice was sounding This land was made for you and me This land is your land This land is my land From California to the New York shining then I was scrolling the wheat fields waving the dust clouds rolling a voice was chanting as the fog was lifting this land was made for you and me this land is your land this land is my land from California everyone. Welcome to Burning 2016 TV's We the People. I'm Aniko Nolan and I'm hosting tonight with our comment moderator Celeste Holmes. And we have our special guest today, Martin Quezada. He is a representative from District uh, 29. Um, and Martin, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I love, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you came to serve the state of Arizona. Oh sure, definitely. I, I'm a I'm a first generation Latino. I was born to uh, immigrant parents from Mexico. Uh, I was born and raised in in West Phoenix, and I've lived the majority of my life in the district that I that I now represent uh, in the Senate, which is uh, the Maryville part of West Phoenix. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask you a few things. Um, we're going to cover a few issues today um, with immigration, education. A lot of things are going on in this state. And um, I'm so glad that you're able to join us. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about first is the gerrymandering that's going on in Arizona and how it has affected your district because you were a representative of District 13 before, right? Yes, I, I used to represent District 13 when I was in the House, and now I represent District 29 in the Senate. Okay, and how does how does can you explain to us how gerrymandering works and what Arizona has done to try to fix that and um, 
then we'll talk about the there was a court case last year that specifically addressed gerrymandering and it affected Arizona. Can you kind of go over how that affected us? Sure. So uh, you know, gerry gerrymandering is a practice where where politicians basically draw districts, they draw uh, the lines of those districts to ensure that they're going to get themselves reelected. Uh, so for a long time here in Arizona, uh, the duty of drawing those lines and drawing those district lines uh, was given to the legislators themselves. So those of us that were elected in the legislature, we drew our own lines. Wow. And as a result, we often guaranteed that we were going to reelect ourselves. Uh, so uh, what, the, what the people of Arizona did, uh, very smartly in my opinion, is they, uh, they um, adopted an initiative. Uh, they, they ran an initiative here in Arizona to uh, adopt an independent redistricting commission. And what this group did, it was a commission of five independent people uh, uh, who, who were completely separate from the legislature, and those people were charged with drawing uh, the district lines. Uh, so what they did is they got to work and they drew the legislative lines and the congressional lines uh, for the state of Arizona. Uh, and as a result, uh, what we saw were districts that were more competitive. We saw districts where uh, uh, minority communities had a better voice in the legislature and in Congress, uh, and, and, and districts that, that were better representative of the people. Mm -hmm. And how, how did these commissioners draw the lines? I mean, do they just go by like one large chunk, whereas whereas when you guys were drawing the, the lines, you can kind of outline where you want your vote, basically the representatives or senators choosing their own voters, basically. Right. So, so what they did and, and what this initiative did is it outlined a very specific procedure uh, for them to draw those lines. Uh, and it said that they are not to consider where any of the incumbents lived, uh, and they were to divide up the districts into equal portions uh, so that each, each district was the same size, and they were to start with a basic grid of the state of Arizona, and then adjust that grid and adjust, adjust those districts uh, to meet a bunch of other requirements uh, and a bunch of other factors that were to be considered uh, in order to protect communities of interest in order to, to protect um, existing political boundaries like cities and counties, uh, to protect uh, minority voting rights, uh, and to um, encourage uh, uh, competitive districts so that there weren't uh, districts that were dominated by one party over another. So uh, in engaging all of those factors, they went through an entire process where they took uh, lots of community input as well so that the community could come into those commissions and tell them how they wanted to be represented uh, and then they, they they evaluated all of those factors and drew and drew maps to uh, uh, to to uh, create these districts. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Supreme Court decision affected more than just Arizona, though, right? It was it's it doesn't affect all states. How does it work that it only affects some states but not all? So the, the, the Supreme Court case that you're talking about was the Arizona Legislature versus the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission. And what happened was uh, the Republicans that were in the state legislature here, they didn't like the fact that the people of Arizona took away that, that redistricting power from them. So they sued. They, they, they sued uh, the redistricting commission. They claimed that it was unconstitutional, that they could draw lines at all. And they wanted to have the power to draw the lines back in the legislature. So specifically for congressional lines. Uh, so they took this case to court. It went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court held that, yes, the people can um, uh, uh, create an independent commission to draw these lines. And so that affects not only Arizona, because it, it, it preserved our, our commission, but it affects uh, all of the other states that are uh, thinking of doing uh, very similar things. Other states have adopted similar commissions or similar um, uh, ways to to redistrict their lines uh, rather than allowing the politicians to do it themselves. Uh, so th what what this Supreme Court did it was a really important decision. Is it preserved the ability uh, of of independent commissions to to do that work? Uh, and I think that's really important because we took that power out of the hands of uh, politicians who who obviously had. Uh, selfish interests in drawing those lines. I mean, you, you can't deny it. Any politician who's running for office, they want to win. Uh, so yeah. um, you, can't, you can't, it's human nature that they're going to want to draw lines that benefit themselves. Uh, so uh, for an independent commission to take on that duty, I think it really serves the people of the state of Arizona and of, and of the entire nation better.
Absolutely. As a resident of Arizona, I really appreciate that. I, I would like to be more represented than, you know, chosen to, to vote for a particular candidate. Exactly. So, uh, and that actually brings up a good point. A lot of seats are going to be empty this year, uh, up for grabs, basically. Uh, so we have to make sure that we elect people in our state that um, benefit us, benefit the people, rather. Um, so you're both voting for Bernie, and I want to make sure that we get people on here, on this show, spread your message, just like we're trying to spread Bernie's message. And your message overlaps with Bernie's quite a bit, right? Uh, what are some I, I, I of the main so, yes. things that uh, you love about Bernie? You know, I, I was I was really excited to endorse Bernie this year, uh, really because he he re-energized me uh, as an elected official uh, to be the best that I can be and to be, and just really to stay true uh, to the values that motivated me to run for office in the first place. Um, you know, once once you get elected into office, it's really hard to not get caught up uh, in 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 the political machine. Of, of government and to start to really believe that um, that you are the important person rather than the seat that you hold being an important seat. And I, I see it far too often with a lot of my colleagues who they get caught up and they start to believe that they are the reason why uh, why they are, they are the best thing that could happen uh, to the people and that it's all about them rather than all, all about being about the issues uh, that motivated the run, run in the first place. And, and what I saw in Bernie um, was that he has stayed consistent for for so many years, for decades. Uh, he has been consistent about his message uh, and consistent about staying true to to values that I think motivated him to run for office in the first place. And those, I think, are the purest values, those ones that motivate you to first want to run. Uh, you want to do good for the people. You want to represent the people, not the special interests. And, and he does that. And so uh, he's re-energized me, and, and I think he's re-energized the country uh, in a lot of ways, and I've seen it here in Arizona in in just the huge response that he's gotten from, especially from young people uh, here in, here in our state that have just been really excited about his message and really excited about um, what he represents and what he stands for as a person. Uh, so I I want to be on board with that because um, it's it's a reminder to me uh, to be a better public servant too. Absolutely. This is a politi political revolution. We need everyone that we can get. Now, in Arizona, um, it's November 8th, right, are the elections for uh, state legislatures. Am I correct on that? And how do we go about garnering support for the same kind of vision that Bernie has here in this state when, uh, as you said earlier, the committee heads are mostly Republicans, so they're kind of directing right. the way uh, what bills are getting heard, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I, Arizona is a place where uh, we really need a, a movement like like the one that Bernie has created uh, in his campaign nationwide. We really need to to re-energize that base here in Arizona for our legislative candidates as well. Because I can tell you that there's a lot of good people who are in office who who are running for office here in the state legislature that share those values and that have been working to to uh, to enact those values here in Arizona. Uh, for many years, but because we are in the minority, and because we 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 aren't uh, friends of of the big money or the big special interests, we have a hard time uh, getting reelected. We have a hard time holding on to our offices, uh, and we have a hard time making a difference. Uh, so uh, we really need to engage people to uh, to pay attention to those uh, to those um, uh, candidates and those elected officials that are doing that work here now, uh, and support them. Uh, in, in their efforts as well, and um, I, I like to count myself as one of them. I, I a lot of the issues that Bernie has stood stood for uh, during this campaign, uh, I've looked back and said, and I've been proud to say that that I've I've fought for those same issues here in Arizona. Uh, and as a result, I think I I, I think my campaign uh, and my election mirrors his in a lot of ways, uh, because you know, like Bernie, I'm I'm not a big friend uh, of the big money. You know, the big money, they're not going to pour a lot of money into my campaign. Uh, they, because I speak out against them, I speak out against the the, the heavy influence that they have for our state government. So, uh, like Bernie, I'm, I'm heavily reliant on on uh, individual donors, small donors, and, and, and the people, the people of the state of Arizona. Uh, so I think, um, you know, what I need is I need I need the people to know who I am and, and know what I stand for. Uh, and I think if they do that, I think they will know uh, uh, that that I'm I'm worthy of their support the same way that they they are supporting uh, Bernie Sanders. 
Mm -hmm. And I, I understand that they tried to get rid of you, right? Oh, of course, absolutely. They've, they've, uh, you know, the uh, the our our big utility uh, corporation here in Arizona, a huge uh, utility, uh, ran a ran a candidate against me in the in the last election in 2014, uh, and it was a close election because they they heavily funded uh, her campaign and they used a lot of dark money in that campaign as well, and and it came close. It came down to the wire, but I was able to pull it off. I think because I had the support of, of the people in my district, uh, and they just announced that they're going to the same individual is going to come against me again this year in 2016. So I mean, I have another tough race, and uh, and I I expect that that uh, it, it's quite possible that 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 she will be funded in in the same way. So I've got to be prepared for that. Uh, and my hope is that um, I, I've built a stronger base this year, and 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 my hope is that I can I can jump on board with this uh, you know political revolution that that Bernie's starting. Well, we're behind you all the way, and hopefully, with these new now these new redistricting uh, districts that they've drawn, um, the ones that you've already or you're already representing, like 29, are those yes. under the new law already? Yeah, or so, does it start? yeah. So the, the the district I represent now, District 29, um, it 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 came about as a result of the last redistricting cycle. Uh, which took place after the 2010 census, uh, mm -hmm. and so this district went into effect um, starting in the 2012 elections. Um, oh, okay. But it is one that, it is it is a district that's being challenged again. I mean, I, I, so there's actually two lawsuits at the at the Supreme Court level, and my district is one that's being challenged again uh, by the Republicans in Arizona uh, that they don't like the they don't like the uh, the fact that the districts have some slight variations in terms of population. Uh, and I explained to you the um, uh, the factors that are considered when those districts are drawn, uh, minority rights, uh, uh, interest, uh, uh, geographic and, and political boundaries. Uh, those often cause some deviations in the, in the amount of population. And so they're challenging the fact that my district uh, uh, took into consideration a lot of those factors. And my district is one that, that protects minority rights. It's a it's a heavily Latino district. Um, it is a it, it does protect community interests, uh, communities of interest. Uh, the community of Maryvale is a very strong community, and it's a uh, and they it's a very uh, uh, a unified con uh, community. And uh, and my district incorporates that community. So uh, they're trying to say that my district shouldn't be existent at all. Uh, and so my hope is that the Supreme Court will rule in our favor, and and my district will be able to. To continue uh, uh, into the future, uh, and um, mm -hmm. I know that's that that ruling should be out sometime this year. That's I'm I'm hoping for that too, Martine. We all are, and uh, here at Bernie 2016 TV, we are definitely going to put our effort towards uh, showing you guys and your message. And um, luckily, Bernie 2016 TV has me in Arizona. <laughs> Right. So maybe we can get uh, as many as possible, as many uh, people who would like to come on our show that are running, um, we would be happy to share their message uh, because we're kind of trying to make it balanced because uh, yes. the networks aren't really showing you know, you or any of these candidates really, or Bernie for that matter, as much. Definitely. Well, now maybe a little bit more, but um, that's one of the best things we we can do to garner support is to show your face on the camera and share your message on the air. Um, and that's actually one of the things, um, there, there was this forum the other day, I don't know if you saw it, the uh, Brown and Black Forum, which is an outreach to minorities, specifically uh, Bernie came on there and talked about um, uh, immigration. And um, if you could talk a little bit about um, what's going on with immigration in this state, um, we're going to kind of hop onto that topic. Um, and if you can kind of describe the family's first uh, agenda and what you agree with that, um, that would be great. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the state of Arizona has really been at the forefront of, of anti-immigrant legislation uh, for many, many years. Uh, well, this is the, 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 the nexus of, of where all of that anti-immigrant rhetoric starts. It all starts here in Arizona. We've been having to deal with this for uh, for the last several years, uh, and it, it continues to get worse. It really does. Uh, Senate Bill 1070 is the infamous uh, anti-immigrant bill been replicated in many other states has started here in Arizona. 
uh, uh, we've got the Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who's notorious around the country for his immigration raids. He, he does raids in my, in my community, actually in my district, where he goes out and tries to raid up immigrants and round them up and, and, and arrest them and take them out. Um, uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, legislators here uh, in the state legislature that continue to push anti-immigrant legislation and, and what they do is they hurt uh, families. And, and what I can tell you here in Arizona is that in a heavily Latino state, uh, in, in a state where we are so close in proximity to Mexico, every Latino family, and I'm one of them, uh, we are a mixture of people who have different immigration statuses. Uh, some of us were, were born here in the United States, like, like myself. Uh, some of us, like my parents, were, were born just a couple of hours away in, in, uh, across the border in Mexico. And so whenever there is um, a, a deportation, a, a raid, a roundup, uh, or some, some uh, other way that, that uh, members of our family are victimized by a broken immigration system, that doesn't just affect that one immigrant. It affects our entire family. And, and so when we talk about immigration on the national stage, uh, we do have to make it a family's first agenda. We have to preserve families. And what we are doing right now uh, as a nation is not doing that. Um, uh, deportations are up. The numbers are up like crazy. Uh, the, the treatment of, of, of families with mixed statuses is, is not, not good here in, here in Arizona especially. Uh, and really across the nation. So I think I think that having a focus on maintaining a strong family uh, is is really really critical. And, and I'm glad to hear that that Bernie is is uh, is behind that issue because once you tear apart that family unit, that's when other things start to go wrong. Uh, kids suffer in school. Uh, there's there's health implications. There's there's uh, uh, financial implications. There's uh, the the whole structure of the community starts to fall apart when you break apart a family. Uh, and so that's something that we need to be, as a country, we have to be doing. We have to be strengthening families rather than tearing them apart. Um, so I, I'm with him 100% on this on this effort. Uh, I'm with him in supporting our dreamers. Um, uh, you know, our dreamers. Who, you know, but for a broken immigration system, these are kids who would be model citizens in our communities. We would be celebrating them and their accomplishments Absolutely. and what they've done. And uh, instead, um, you know, they're 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 blacklisted and they're treated uh, as inferiors and, and that's really sad. Uh, so uh, I, I'm really supportive of, of the efforts that Bernie's making in this area. Yeah, I am too. I, I appreciate it very much. He had um, Bobby De La Rosa uh, speak for him in Tucson, uh, open for him, and Naylan Pike, who's a Native American uh, a young lady who spoke about Oak Flat. So there are many examples mm -hmm. of our leaders kind of letting us down as far as um, outreach towards minorities. They're, they're really not in any way in the ballpark of what Bernie's doing. So um, I would like to actually, let me go to Celeste Holmes and the chat room okay. first, and then we're going to play a little video about um, Bernie's stance on immigration. Great. Celeste, All right, let me, are there let, some let me comments to, and questions that yeah, you'd like to ask? Let me not do the rookie thing and, un, and, and not unmute myself. Um, we, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, a lot of people are just sitting here, you know, grateful that you're um, joining us and, um, pardon me, and that you're as knowledgeable as you are with regarding redistricting. Um, mm -hmm. And they're also grateful that you are a Bernie supporter. So that's kind of covered some of the, some of the, you know, just standard comments. But let me let me give you a couple of the questions that. Um, have to do with the the redistricting is what what is being done to address the redistricting issue is one of the questions will it what you're doing be accomplished by the time we have the election in November of 16 and mm -hmm. how is Bernie's support lining up in Arizona okay yeah no definitely I think uh, as far as the, the redistricting issue first um, I think it's important that the, the public uh, supports the commission that we have in place. We and not not necessarily the individuals on the commission, but the fact that we have a commission and that concept of having an independent commission. The commission does a great job of of removing itself from the politics behind drawing those 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 district lines. Uh, and so that concept is very important. And as voters, as voters who enacted this commission. Uh, you need to communicate to your legislators 
uh, that you don't want them messing with it. And, and that's what they're doing. When they file these lawsuits, they're trying to mess with that process, and they're trying to uh, uh, take away the ability of that commission to do its job, the job that the voters wanted them to do. So uh, be vocal. Uh, contact your contact your, your state legislators. Contact the governor and tell them that you support the, the redistricting commission concept and, and you, want, you want it to move forward. Um, so aside from that, you know, the, the commission is still in place as it is now, and they will still, uh, they're still tasked, tasked to, to do the redistricting again after the 2020 census. Uh, so that, that, that effort is going to start ramping up in the next couple of years. Uh, and right. so um, uh, until then, we just have to make sure that we protect that ability for them to do that. Um, in addition to that, I think uh, um, it's important that we all, we all continue to vote. Uh, and, and the more we vote, it doesn't matter how good those district lines are drawn and how much the minority voting uh, rights are protected or how much those communities of interest are protected. If we don't register and we don't turn out to vote, uh, we're still going to have the same results. Uh, right. So be active, be engaged in the, in, in the political process, uh, and vote. I'm sorry, what was that last question again? Uh, well, you, you kind of covered it, so I'll, okay, I'll give good. you one of the, the next ones that's in there, um, and it has to do with Joe Arpaio. Um, okay. Melted Pearls wants to know when a class action lawsuit will be uh, filed against Arpaio, and um, I, I live in the state of Texas, so uh -huh. I certainly understand regressive um, Bubba thinking, if you will, uh, right. in, in rural law enforcement and um, clearly we have border issues in the state of Texas and mm -hmm. um, our, our fuck nuttery in the government is just, you know, send the National Guard and, you know, piss away taxpayer dollars, you know. Uh, Arizona, how are, how are y'all going to try to deal with, you know, that same kind of nuttery a few states over? Well, you know what? Uh, that's interesting. You ask about uh, a suit against Sheriff Arpaio because not a lot of people realize this, but there is one going on right now, uh, and Arpaio has been held in contempt uh, by a federal court judge uh, multiple times now, and that 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 case is ongoing uh, for violating the order not to do those discriminatory actions that he's been doing. Uh, so that that court case is actually going to be. Uh, coming to an end fairly soon. I don't know the exact timeline of it, but um, it, right now it looks like Arpaio's in some big trouble uh, before that judge. The judge does not like what he's doing right now, and there's a, I think there's a very good chance that uh, uh, that you know we we get we take care of Sheriff Arpaio uh, through the judi through the judicial branch rather than through uh, through other through through electing elections. Uh, and so I think that um, you know that I, I have a lot of hope that. That we may be able to get rid of Arpaio because he's he's been so blatantly um, uh, unconstitutional in his uh, discriminatory actions, and that case is ongoing right now. And so you've got the Department of Justice involved. You've got a civil suit be, uh, uh, be, before a federal court uh, uh, judge uh, going on right now, and that's all happening right now. Uh, so that that actually could happen in the next few months. Well, wow, that's really interesting. interesting. I is Arpaio um, still able to serve as sheriff and like fulfill his sheriff duties while this is going on? This lawsuit is going on. Yeah, un unfortunately, yeah, and 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 he is. He is still our sheriff, and he's still uh, he's still um, uh, operating as such. But but he's definitely under a very close watch right now. Uh, they have an independent monitor that's basically babysitting him right now to make sure he doesn't do. He doesn't violate court orders and go out and, and discriminate against people, uh, but he's still finding ways to do it. So uh, uh, it's it, it's an interesting situation in in Maricopa County right now uh, because of that lawsuit and how that's playing itself out. But yeah, he still is our sheriff as of right now. Mm -hmm. And there were some uh, some bills that we'll talk about after the. Uh, um, the little video that I wanted to show here, uh, but some specific bills that are discriminatory towards the communities that you're talking about. So, um, if John, you can bring up that video uh, of Bernie, um, let's have that first, and then we'll talk about those two bills. It was um, SB 1017 and 1044. So, we'll talk about those, Martine, okay. in a minute, okay? Sure. And John is bringing up this video from Bernie Sanders himself. Um, this was from Thanksgiving, I think. Uh, 
As we gather to give thanks with our families and friends at this time of year, we should reflect that not all families will be able to be together and that millions of families have been torn apart by our broken immigration policies. As we give thanks, we cannot forget about the millions of aspiring Americans who continue to live in the shadow of our great nation and the need to enact policies to unite them. As the son of an immigrant, I can tell you that their story, my story, your story, our story, is the story of America, the story of hardworking families coming to the United States to create a brighter future for their kids. It is a story rooted in family and fueled by hope. It is a story that continues to this day in families all across our country. Today, we have 11 million people in this nation who are undocumented, 99% of whom came to this country to improve their lives, to escape oppression, to flee desperate poverty and violence. I supported the 2013 Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill in the Senate because I strongly believe there should be a responsible path to citizenship so that individuals can come out of the shadows, can hold their heads high and have the protection of the law and participate fully and openly in American society. The Senate bill contained the provisions of the DREAM Act that I strongly support. It is my belief that we should recognize that, that the young men and women who comprise the dreamers for what they are, American kids who deserve the right to be in the country they know as their home. This is not to say that I do not have significant criticisms of this long and complicated bill. I believe that arbitrary cutoff eligibility dates, border security triggers, and other obstacles were measures that many believe were put in place so that the path to legalization and citizenship would be delayed or even denied for millions of undocumented individuals here. I want to change those provisions and if elected president, I will do everything I can to change those provisions. I also believe that the penalties and fines in the bill would be a bar for the lowest income people, essentially preventing them from accessing the path to legal residency and eventual citizenship. To be meaningful, a pathway to citizenship needs to be achievable for the millions of workers at the lower end of the economic ladder. These and other barriers in the bill, including the years, often more than a decade, that it would take to achieve citizenship makes it a flawed piece of legislation that needs to be improved. Until we can pass comprehensive immigration reform, we must be aggressive in pursuing policies that are humane and sensible and that keep families together. This includes taking immediate measures that are currently available, including using the presidential power of executive order. I think President Obama did exactly the right thing through his executive orders to unite families. DACA and DAPA were good first steps, but much more needs to be done. Let me tell you what I will do as president. First, within my first 100 days in office, I will expand upon President Obama's executive actions to provide broad administrative relief to the parents of dreamers, the parents of citizens, the parents of legal permanent residents, and the rest of the immigrant population who would have been legalized if the House of Representatives had only taken a vote on immigration reform. I will expand the use of humanitarian parole to ensure the return of unjustly deported immigrants, including our veterans. The United States must do the right thing and guarantee the swiftest possible reunification of these broken families. I will overhaul our immigrant detention system to reduce this number, I will direct immigration officers to immediately stop initiating deportations against those eligible for relief. I will also end family detentions. We will no longer be a nation that has children being raised in private, for-profit prisons. My administration will end contracts with private, for-profit immigration detention centers. I will work to end federal programs that provide financial incentives to arrest and detain immigrants for routine traffic or other infractions. This would include enhancing access to justice, proper legal counsel, and reversing the criminalization of immigration. In my view, we should not deny a path to citizenship to an undocumented parent, 
for re-entering the country after being separated from their children or for not having a driver's license. I will direct my administration to extend humane treatment and asylum to victims of domestic violence and unaccompanied minors coming from Latin America as a distinct group of people fleeing persecution. I will also expand asylum programs for members of the LGBT community escaping mistreatment and abuse. America has always been a haven for the oppressed. We cannot, we must not shirk the historic role of the United States as a protector of vulnerable people fleeing persecution. In addition, let's not just demand immigrant integration, let's unite to make it happen. Our job right now is to bring our people together, to end the divisions between black and white, native-born immigrants, gays, straights, men and women. And when we stand together as a people, when we fight for economic justice, when we fight for social justice, when we fight to take on the fossil fuel industry and combat climate change, when we stand together, there is nothing, nothing, nothing we cannot accomplish. Thank you all very much for the work that you do, and I look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead. Thanks. So yeah, that was uh, Bernie's immigration stance. Pretty detailed there. Um, there's so many factors that affect each other. Um, Martine, if you can respond to Bernie's stance and add some things that you want before we, and then we can kind of start talking about some of the bills that exactly are doing what um, Bernie is opposing here. Is they're anti-immigration bills. They're um, basically against. Um, any kind of reforms that we're trying to do here. Can you respond uh, you know, on think, that, uh, Yeah, no, I, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's taking really a comprehensive approach to this issue. I mean, immigration is a complicated problem. It's a complicated issue, and and to all we've heard from the other side of the aisle have been really uh, overly simplified solutions that really aren't solutions at all. Uh, when you oversimplify the issue so much, uh, you're not going to solve the problems. And so uh, to take a look at all aspects of this I think is important. Uh, and it's important to change the perspective in which we look uh, at the immigrant community and we look at the immigration issue in our in our nation and, 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 and find ways to make it better. And because he has that better perspective of it, uh, uh, I think the solutions are going to be better as well. And we're going to have better conversations about about what we what we do with immigration, so uh, I, I'm glad to hear what he's doing, and 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 I'm very supportive, especially uh, once once we we start protecting that 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 family core, uh, which we which is what we absolutely need to do to make make all of us better, even including uh, the non-immigrant members uh, of those families that are affected by this broken system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. Uh, now the two bills that um, I wanted to bring up was. Uh, the first one was 1044, which is the census bill. Can you kind of explain what that is about and who is who is trying to push this bill? Right. So Senate Bill 1044 uh, was originally on an agenda uh, yesterday, uh, but they the sponsor of the bill pulled it at the last minute, so we didn't actually hear the bill. Uh, but it may come back later. Um, so the sponsor is Senator John Kavanaugh, and he's notorious for introducing anti-immigrant legislation. Uh, he's he was a co-sponsor of or he was a prime sponsor of Senate Bill 1070 back back when that was introduced mm -hmm. uh, and and he brought this one forward as well and what what the bill would have done is it would have denied uh, cities uh, funding uh, for 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 any undocumented immigrants that were counted in their mid um, mid their mid-year census when they do a census in the middle of the decade rather than at the end of every decade so every city they can do they can request to do another census halfway through the decade uh, to update their numbers to update their populations and to get additional funding if those populations have grown uh, so what his bill would have done is it would it would have had denied it would have denied funding uh, to anybody that's counted in that census that's not a documented uh, citizen uh, and so it really was a, a mean-spirited bill uh, that really punished cities uh, simply for having uh, immigrants that are living within their boundaries. Jeez. And um, what are what are the likelihoods of that 
bill passing, um, is that still on the floor? Has that been presented, or where? what's the status of it? So he, he would have to move that uh, through his committee first. Uh, and we last week, or this week actually, uh, was really the first, it's the first week of the session. So we've got a long way to go. So there's still a, a ways when he can uh, he can uh, put it on another agenda and try to move it forward. Uh, whether it's going to be successful or not, I I don't know. I mean, this this is one of the more extreme uh, uh, ideas that he's proposed. So I don't, I'm hoping that it won't have the... Uh, the support that it will need to pass, um, especially because uh, so many other people, non-immigrants, are also affected by this bill uh, because of a, a city. If they lose that funding, uh, the whole city suffers, not just not just the immigrants that live there. So uh, I'm hoping that people sure. will will realize that and will share that with him and and tell him that this is not a good idea to push forward. Uh, but you never know. I mean, he could he could still try to push it anyway. So we'll find out in the next yeah. couple of weeks. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Right, so we will find out in the next couple of weeks. Okay, yeah. that's yeah, that's a pretty good <laughs> estimation. I, I I hope it goes uh, our way. I hope it doesn't go through. Um, the other one I wanted to mention was a 1017. And that was the one about the one Phoenix ID. What is right. that all about? Um, is can you explain what that is? Who wants it? Who doesn't want it? Who would it benefit? All that kind of thing. Sure. So the 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 one ID is actually a, a really interesting uh, story. Um, so what happened was uh, there was a group of community activists uh, in the city of Phoenix, uh, and they were looking at at the way the city runs their government and um, what kind of services were accessible uh, to different people uh, and how a lot of people weren't able to have access to a lot of the city services uh, and a lot of just basic identification that they needed in order to feel safe and productive in, in society. And we're talking not only immigrants, but immigrants were definitely a big, a big portion of that, but um, uh, elderly, uh, disabled individuals, uh, the LGBT community, um, uh, and, and several others uh, who were having difficulty with, uh, with obtaining an ID and, and, and obtaining city services. So what they did is they identified this problem, uh, they worked together, to come up with the with the idea to create uh, a municipal ID, uh, it would be an ID card that the city of Phoenix would issue uh, to people, and it would it, it would be used for um, many purposes, not only as an identification card, but as a card that would allow them to access all the city services that you need a you need a card for. Uh, it would be a library card. It would be um, a, a a community center card. It would be uh, uh, a card to access the city dump. Uh, it would be every every city service that you need a card for, this card would function as that card. So it would combine all the cards into one. So it really sounded like a, uh, like a, a great idea. And so what they did is they presented this to the city council and they worked with the council's lawyers and, and they worked with the law enforcement community. They worked with uh, the legal team. They worked with uh, uh, other uh, stakeholders and they they came up with a compromise uh, concept, and and they got the city council to uh, to vote to uh, uh, to to move forward with uh, with with research on how to get this thing done. And so um, uh, the big the big issue with the card was that uh, it would give it would give undocumented individuals the ability to have an identification card, so that they would feel confident to to engage with law enforcement if they were victims of crime or if they were witnesses to a crime, they would feel confident that they could call the police uh, and show that ID card and not be harassed because they don't have ID. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the big problem here in Arizona because there's not a lot of trust between um, our immigrant community and our law enforcement. Um, so they, they were successful in moving this thing forward at the city of Phoenix. And uh, Senate Bill 1017, uh, again, sponsored by Senator Kavanaugh, uh, his bill would come in and and not allow that card to be used as an identification card. So it basically cut the legs out from under that whole effort, and it really defeated the purpose of having the card in the first place. Uh, so it's really just uh, destroying the efforts of these activists and these leaders in our community that uh, that that uh, came up with a solution to a problem. Uh, and so it's real unfortunate uh, because uh, especially uh, the 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 immigrant community, uh, uh, which is large here in Phoenix, uh, and, and our ability to be functioning uh, in society and 
and to to feel safe uh, in in the way we interact with law enforcement um, is really going to be hampered if we if we aren't able to to obtain this this type of an ID card. And so uh, that bill went through committee um, yesterday, and it was a pretty heated committee, and there was a lot of testimony and a lot of a lot of uh, uh, chaos in that committee. The chairman actually, the chairman who's the sponsor of the bill, actually kicked a bunch of protesters out of the committee. Uh, once they got up and they started, they, they were upset because this was another anti-immigrant bill. So he kicked them out of the committee, uh, and the bill uh, it passed by a vote of four to three. Uh, and I was one of the one of the three that voted no on the bill, um, but it passed out anyway. So that bill is moving still, and it still has a, it still has life in it. Wow. So that's, that bill's in the same boat, the final result of it uh, in the coming weeks. Yes, yes, absolutely. So in the meantime, it's in effect, so people are able to get these cards, right? Well, no, not, not even yet. Uh, the, the cards aren't even in effect yet. This, the city is studying the issue, and they're trying to figure out a way to actually uh, uh, give out these cards. And actually, uh, they're still doing research on how to get it done. So Senator Kavanaugh is trying to destroy the effort before it ever goes into effect. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm just I just to clear in my mind how it goes. So if they got this card and they you know let's say say they were witness to a crime or something, and they mm -hmm. have to interact with the police, how mm -hmm. does that card not then give the authorities um, you know here's this immigrant who you know is not here legally um, but has this card? How does that did the police then respect the card as a yeah. like is it like help me understand yeah, the, that so the, so the thought is that that uh, uh, all the law enforcement's goal when they interact with especially with victims or witnesses to a crime uh, they they're not looking to, to to interact with those people as suspects mm -hmm. they're looking to engage with these people to to create good police reports so that they can uh, handle uh, the crime that is taking place um, mm -hmm. So, if if an immigrant doesn't have any other form of ID, and right now they can't get any form of ID, uh, they're not going to call the police because the police are going to ask them. They're, they're, the first question that the law enforcement officer is going to ask is, "Who am I talking to? Who are you? And how can you prove to me who you are?" Uh, sure. And so, if they're not able to produce some some form of ID, uh, then that's when suspicions are raised by law enforcement, and that's when the that that interaction takes a whole other takes a whole other direction. Um, so if if that person is able to produce an ID, the law enforcement officer looks at it and says, "Okay, I'm talking to uh, Jose Ramirez. Uh, tell me what you saw, Jose. Tell me what how you were victimized." And 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 that becomes the interaction between law enforcement, uh, rather than, "Well, who are you and how can you prove who you are?" And it, and and since you can't prove to me who you are, should you even be here? And that becomes more of the interaction. So uh, the thought is, we we want to be able to limit uh, opportunities where uh, uh, there is a distrustful interaction between law enforcement and any member of our community, whether they are an immigrant or not. And and the fact is, here in Arizona, uh, even people who are legal citizens of the United States, they don't feel comfortable calling calling the police either, uh, especially if they don't happen to have an ID with them either. If there's no need for us to have a driver's license, or or uh, you're an elderly individual, uh, why are you going to call the police if they're going to harass you as well? Um, so. Uh, this is one opportunity for for people to have uh, an ability to interact with law enforcement and do it confidently, uh, and and be able to assist law enforcement in solving other crimes that are taking place in our community. Okay, thank you. So, so the existence of this card is basically uh, what makes the authorities kind of respect the fact that uh, right. this is a person who is an innocent bystander or a victim and we're not going to harass them with, um, in, in other words, it's not going to create a list of people who now these names of uh, people that Sheriff Joe Arpaio can look up and be like, oh, let's go get these people. Right, correct. You yeah, know, no, this, with the this, raids uh, and stuff that you mentioned. Yeah, all it does is it, 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 it identifies that person as, this person's not a suspect. This is who it is and this is proof of who this person is. That's it. How can somebody be against that? I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, they, they've, Bill. Raised all sorts of, they've raised all sorts of issues and, and reasons why, but, but it's basically, uh, you know, they, they want to be able to go after immigrants. They want to be able to uh, have suspicious interactions with immigrants, and, and, and this just allows them to keep doing that. Yeah. 
Well, I, I hope that bill fails, and I hope that these cards can uh, come into effect and everybody can use them as they need to. Um, let's go to Celeste uh, in the chat and see if we've got some comments or questions about this specific issue or anything that you'd like to mention, Celeste. Well, we've been kind of going back and forth about, you know, ID mechanisms and um, <clears throat> it kind of got off onto the topic of chips and embedded chips into human beings and interesting things like that, <laughs> as you can as you can well imagine. But um, we do I do have a, a couple of questions in here. Um, mm -hmm. Ryan Havlicek has asked, with the Republican co controlled Congress, should Democrats be wary of counting on the Latino vote if a Republican candidate ever offered up any sort of comprehensive immigration plan? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a big concern. Um, and I think that uh, you know, the Latino community and their relationship with, with the Democratic Party has never been uh, uh, one that, that you can take for granted. And I think it's unfortunate that, that in a lot of ways the Democratic Party has taken the Latino vote for granted. Uh, but um, that, that's why it's so important for our candidates to, to have such strong positions uh, on comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and I think that's why, why I'm supportive of what Bernie Sanders is doing, because he does have that. Uh, but if, if Democratic candidates, and I'm talking about all of them in general, if they don't uh, 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 if they don't address the, the issues that are uh, critical to to the Latino community, they're going to lose those votes. Uh, and so I think that it's very important that that um, our Democratic candidates are 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 solid on those issues, and and, and we can always get better on them. So um, I, I think Bernie's off to a great start in that in that regard, uh, and I'm hopeful that that the other that that will influence the other candidates as well to take to take strong positions in terms of. of of taking care of our, our Latino community because we, we need that help and we're looking for that leadership from from uh, from anybody whether it's uh, the Democrats or the Republicans and I think I think that the Democrats have an easier uh, an easier uh, path to win that support uh, because uh, that relationship has been closer all along but it's not a sure thing so work needs to be done there right there and there's there's two comments that also pertain to this this portion of the conversation too and um, cynical girl says and somehow the GOP are oblivious to our melting pot or that our nation was stolen from its native peoples inhabitants to begin with now they're bent on closing borders and rejecting people fleeing war and then Donna Bradley brings up a, you know a real interesting point when you're talking about um, uh, immigration issues and her comment is the real immigration issue is the second piece that is not discussed and that's the H1B visas um, mm -hmm. What are what are your um, thoughts on, on you know the H one B visa and um, what it's doing with immigration and how it's you know how it actually how those H one B visas uh, truly affect the the Latino community um, especially since they are um, some of the lowest paid workers we have in the country right now um, especially the undocumented workers. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, and that's why we need. That's why we need a comprehensive reform, uh, and comprehensive reform is going to look at all of these issues, and to make sure that there aren't uh, certain categories of people who are being uh, taken advantage of by by this by this system. And I think that uh, you know, it's it's true that we've got we've got a lot of uh, a lot of individuals who are who are who are low paid and who are uh, uh, hardworking. They're they're breaking their backs and they're they're sacrificing their own personal health uh, to build this nation and and. And, uh, and and we need to take better care of them uh, because they they really are building our country. They're building America, and uh, and that's been that's been true for many many years. Uh, and uh, you know we we've all got family members uh, uh, who have done that, who have been part of the, that that immigrant labor, um, uh, that that blood, sweat, and tears that that built this nation. Uh, so we we need to be looking at a at a comprehensive reform that that looks at all aspects of of the way we. Uh, the way we bring people into our our, our nation, the way we uh, uh, immigrate them into into America, and 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 the way we we make it a functioning system. So I, I have my own personal question. Um, given that I qualify as a Caucasian uh, mm -hmm. currently, based on statistics, but my you know my heritage is of uh, Jewish, German, and Catholic descent on my mother's side and Armenian descent on my father's and my, my grandmother survived uh, the 
slaughter of the Armenians by the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. She was sold into slavery to the Saudis and uh, then bought out of slavery and brought over here. So I, I know that slavery still exists and you know we we talk about uh, you know, human trafficking, and um, again, given that I live in a border state, you live in a border state. It, you know, both of our states are dealing with human trafficking issues. Mm -hmm. What What do you see uh, in in terms of how we help the Hispanic community with regards to you know these type of issues, and you know, going back to um, you know visa issues and um, immigration reform? Yeah, no, I, I think. Uh, uh, you know that's a great point. You know, human trafficking is is it's a growing industry, and uh, especially here in in Arizona, where we have uh, it, it, we have tourist um, attractions here in Arizona. Uh, just recently, we had our our national college football championship uh, take place actually in my district uh, in Arizona. Uh, we had the Super Bowl just a, a, a couple years back. Uh, we've got uh, major sports. Um, uh, events and what happens when when those major sporting events take place is the human trafficking comes with it uh, and and who are the people that are that are victimized by that a lot of times it's our, it's our people and it's it's that's something that we need to take a closer look at I, I do I do feel confident that um, uh, in Arizona that that has been something that 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 we've all uh, uh, been aware of and that we are taking strong stances to combat. Uh, and e even even the the Republican members of, of our legislature have recognized this as a problem, and and they've taken steps to uh, uh, to combat human trafficking here in Arizona. So uh, uh, you know, obviously more work needs to be done, but but we need to be more aware about this issue and 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 let people know that it's it's still taking place and it's still happening. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celeste, for the questions, and thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging out in the chat and participating in the conversation. We appreciate that. Please like and subscribe our videos. Um, let's hop over to the topic of education real quick um, before the end of the show comes here. Uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, you were at uh, Doug Ducey's State of the State speech, right, uh, yes. uh, Sen Senator Kizada? <clears throat> yes, yes, I was. And what did you get out of that? What was his main point? And I understand that uh, he purports himself as an advocate advocate of uh, education, but yet there are all these cuts to education in the state of Arizona. Public schools and the universities, especially, have been significantly cut. Right. Um, so yeah, how do absolutely. those two, two things mesh in his mind? <laughs> Cutting education, but being such a proponent of it. Yeah, no, the, 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 the Republican Party here in Arizona and, and the re elected Republicans in the legislature and in the governor's office, they have been making drastic cuts to public education uh, for many, many years now. Uh, and, and so what happened as a result of a lot of these cuts is uh, the people of Arizona sued the state of Arizona uh, over um, uh, a proposition that we had passed a few years back that required the legislature uh, to increase funding for education by the rate of inflation every year. So it's a little bit of money every year that, that by the rate of inflation or 2%, whichever was, whichever was uh, 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 the, the, the higher amount uh, or the lower amount, I'm sorry, um, it required the legislature to provide that extra funding every year. And the legislature said, no, we're just not going to do that. We're not going to fund that. And so that lawsuit uh, uh, went through the court system for, for a long time and eventually um, uh, we won. We won that lawsuit, and the judge ruled that that the state of Arizona owed our public schools uh, over three, uh, close to four billion dollars in back in back pay uh, for that inflation funding. Um, and so, what what the governor did is uh, he took credit for the settlement of that lawsuit. After the judge ruled in our favor, we reached a settlement that that uh, that would send a. a, a a ballot or initiative to the ballot uh, for the voters to vote on on the settlement to approve a funding package. And he took credit uh, for that funding package and said that it was him investing in public education. Uh, and that was the that was the his um, his theme in the state of the state was that uh, we just invested uh, over three billion dollars in public education. Uh, but you know it's 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 really disingenuous because. Uh, they didn't do that at the kindness of their heart. They did that because they were forced to do that because a judge ordered them to do that. Um, right. And so, 
that's going to be his selling point when he runs for re-election is that I gave $3.5 billion to our schools and, and I invested more money in public education than any governor in the, in the past. But in reality, the only reason that they did that, and, and I think that's very true, is because uh, they were ordered to do so by a judge. Uh, and so um, now as we look forward, uh, we have to we have to look at our governor and ask him if that's going to be the extent of his of his investment in public education because we still got a long way to go in Arizona. We're at forty we're at number forty nine in the nation in terms of funding for public ed, and and we we owe a lot more money to our schools uh, uh, in order to get us to a place where where we are going to be able to provide the kind of education that our kids deserve and to get us into a respectable ranking in terms of the rest of the nation. And so it's going to be real interesting to see if the governor is going to stop any more investment in education as after that, after that uh, settlement or if he's going to give any more. And I don't think he's going to give any more. I don't think he has, he has it in him to, uh, to give any more to our public schools. Uh, and again, that, 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 uh, that hurts uh, uh, the people that support us, the people that support me. Uh, it hurts my mm -hmm. community. Uh, my poor and minority communities, uh, those are the ones that are suffering. Those are the kids that are in our schools right now. Yeah, that's that's interesting. That Now, Doug Ducey, where, where does this money that he cut, where does he put it? Where does it go? Tax cuts for special interests, or where, is there a special uh, place that yeah, he wants you, to you, allocate the money instead? You hit the nail on the head. Uh, he's He has given uh, corporate tax cuts, uh, 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 big interest uh, special tax credits. Uh, it has been really favors to to uh, uh, big corporate interests that have gotten the the, the benefit of of uh, the cuts to public education. Uh, and and it's the 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 only the only uh, uh, part of our budget that has grown uh, through our recession has been the Department of Corrections. Uh, so the private prison industry has has benefited off of this as well. So. Uh, you know, it, it's really a matter of misplaced priorities on the terms, on, on, uh, on the hands of the governor and, and the Republican legislature. They've, they've, they've given money to, to, to prisons and to uh, corporations, and they've taken money from our kids and our schools. And it's really that simple. And so uh, it's up to our voters to, uh, uh, to hold them accountable for that. Yes, yes, and we will, uh, because I think the people of Arizona are intelligent people, and we're not going to yeah. continue to stand for this anymore. Um, you know, we definitely, like you said, we need to prioritize. Um, thank you for that answer and explanation. Um, the last thing we wanted to talk about uh, really quick is um, there, there is this article that you had posted uh, and there are bills that uh, have been presented or submitted, and they are supposedly bills that will go nowhere, right? <laughs> but they are common sense bills. I think most of them are common sense bills. Um, but if we could just go through those real quick, John, um, just the ones especially that uh, Martine submitted, um, or and if you, Martine, if you could talk about those. Um, sure. They're very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I mean, I, first of all, I, I want to state that it's even though I serve in the minority party, uh, and very few of my bills go anywhere uh, uh, every year because we are in the minority. Uh, it's important for us to still uh, uh, propose ideas that are progressive, ideas that represent the values of the people of Arizona and represent the values of people whose voices aren't being heard here at the legislature. So I propose these bills every year. And I and I push these issues every year, and I try to insert these issues into the debate every year, because it's important that that the public knows that that there are people who are who are on their side and are pushing these issues. Uh, so uh, even if they don't have a chance of of becoming law and getting signed by the governor, uh, I still introduce them every year, and I try to introduce them into the debate, and I offer them as amendments to other bills, and I offer them as uh, uh, as as talking points when we talk about uh, similar other bills, uh, but one of them uh, that I introduced this year, uh, I was working very closely with uh, uh, one of my local school districts and uh, and, and, and an up and coming school board member uh, who serves in the Phoenix Union High School District. Her name is Stephanie Barra. Uh, she came to me with an issue and and she said that her school district uh, they were they were um, updating their their sex ed curriculum, uh, and in so doing. They came across a statute uh, that prohibited the, dis the, the school district uh, uh, from 
uh, quote unquote promoting homosexuality as a uh, as a life choice uh, in sex ed curriculum. And so when they when they came across that statute, they shared it with their lawyers. Their lawyers interpreted it to mean that they can't talk about uh, homosexuality at all uh, in their sex ed curriculum. And so that really that really uh, caused them con some, con some concern because they felt that they wouldn't be able to talk about every issue um, that comes across uh, uh, average students in high school, uh, whether they are straight, whether they are gay, and, 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 and being able to teach them uh, the best way to engage in safe sex practices and to engage in healthy uh, 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 practices that keep them, keep them safe as individuals. Uh, and so they, they came to me with that statute, and, and I proposed a bill that would repeal that, that would allow them to adopt a, uh, a responsible and a, a well-rounded uh, sex ed curriculum. Uh, and that was Senate Bill 1019. Uh, I dropped it earlier this year, and, um, and it was listed in that article as a bill that makes a lot of sense but would probably not go anywhere because of uh, our conservative Republican legislature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's so important to, uh, for, to, for students to understand sexuality on a fact-based uh, basis. Um, I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous that anybody would be against that bill. Um, and another one was, um, it, I just thought here, I'm uh, sorry, I flipped back to the other page. It was regarding um, portraying homosexuality, Senate Bill 1019. It would overturn a current state law that prohibits public schools from teaching anything that may promote a homosexual lifestyle or portray it in a positive light. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's the one. That's <laughs> What's the one. going on with that one? Yeah, no, that that that's the one I, I was just talking about. That was uh, it was it was brought to my attention by the Phoenix Union High School District, uh, and they were they were outraged that this law was was on the books and and they felt that it it really hurt them in their effort to. Uh, to uh, uh, adopt a curriculum that would that would uh, uh, protect their students, uh, and, uh, and 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 I saw that as really troubling as well. And and if if we're not protecting our students and teaching them, uh, you know, uh, the smart way to to engage in 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 in, in these activities, we're 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 really failing them, and we're we're, we're putting them in danger. Uh, so that's why I moved that bill forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the same bill that, then. Uh, that's not two separate bills. The homosexuality right. one and the sex education one. Right, right. Okay, okay. Sorry, I thought those were two separate bills. Okay, um, what else have you submitted? Do you have anything else that you'd like to specifically uh, tell the audience uh, or, um, you know, tell them anything that you've uh, submitted that's in committee that we haven't mentioned? Yeah, no, a, a couple more ideas that I presented. I, I presented a whole package of elections bills. Uh, that would make uh, elections in the state of Arizona uh, easier, simpler, and more accessible to your average voter. Uh, I think that we should be making voting easier for everybody instead of making it more restrictive. And we've, in Arizona, we've placed a number of barriers in front of in front of voters, and um, uh, the goal has very clearly been uh, to reduce the voter turnout in Arizona. So uh, my effort has been to do the exact opposite and to open the doors to the voters. Uh, to, to get them to um, uh, uh, to be able to cast their vote and do it and, and participate in the democratic process. Um, so a couple of those, uh, I, I'm, I'm dropping an automatic voter registration bill. Uh, I'm going to drop that within the next couple of days, and that, that would, would automatically great. automatically register every voter in the state of Arizona and allow them to opt out if they so wish, uh, and, and it would put them on our permanent early voter list as well. Uh, so I'm uh, I, I'm introducing that bill. Um, I introduced a bill. I think that's that's uh, uh, really um, uh, it, it falls in line with uh, with the campaign that that Bernie Sanders is running. Uh, I introduced a bill that would open up uh, our presidential primary elections to independent voters. Uh, right now, uh, only members of the Democratic or the Republican Party can participate in those elections, and we're leaving out uh, the. Over one third of our registered voters in Arizona are independent, and we are prohibiting them from participating in that election. And I think those are a lot of them are exactly the kind of people that would be supporting Bernie Sanders for president. Uh, so um, uh, I'm, I, I, I introduced a bill that would open up that that election to to independent voters, uh, so they mm -hmm. could choose whether they wanted to vote in the Democratic or the Republican uh, presidential preference election. 
Uh, and I think it's important that we we never exclude any voter from any election, uh, because again, the the more participation we have, the the better results we will get. Uh, and and I think that we should be we should be encouraging everyone to vote. Um, so those are just a, just a handful of them. Uh, I'm also dropping a same day voter registration bill that would allow people to register to vote the day of the election. Uh, instead, right now you have to register a month before the election. Uh, otherwise, you can't vote in that election. So uh, what happens is a lot of people they start uh, they barely start paying attention to the election. Uh, yeah. about Until a it's right before. around the corner. And yeah, and then by then, by the time they're paying attention, it's too late for them to register. So they show up and they try to register, they try to vote, and they're turned away, and they they feel they feel disgusted with the process, and then they're turned off as voters. Uh, so I think it's real sad that we have that in place, and and I think same day voter registration would would uh, would would open up the doors to a lot of people who 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 would want to participate. Uh, so those are just a handful of them that that I've introduced, and I've got a whole lot of other ideas, but uh, uh, I hope that um, your viewers will will interact with me and 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 connect with me on social media. I'll be t I'll be sharing uh, ideas about all of those bills as as we move through the process. Awesome! I'm so glad you're in there. Thank you so much for all those great ideas. Um, before we go, I'm going to check in with Celeste in the chat room one last time and thank everybody for participating. And then we're going to um, just do a call to action and call your uh, Congress people here in Arizona to get these bills through. Um, so Celeste, what's going on there? And uh, final thoughts. Uh, well, we're really just kind of talking. I've been sharing all of the different links to the slides that you've been showing, and I've shared the link to uh, Martin's uh, <coughs> campaign site page. Thank you. I, I have a little anxiety. Every once in a while I get caught up a little short. Sorry about that. Um, otherwise, uh, it's been a delight to um, have you visit with us and share your perspective. Um, it looks like you're really trying to do some positive things in Arizona, and I support you in those efforts. And um, I'm asking everyone in chat as well as um, out on the social media to help get your message out there that you're a, um, you're, you're a, bir you're a birdie Democrat, and that's what we want to get into office. Thank you very right. much. No, thank you guys. Thank it's you been so a much, pleasure. Celeste. Okay, um, Martin Quezada, thank you so much for uh, being on our show. Uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to close with? And um, then we'll go out with our final song. No, th uh, th thank you all for having me. It's been a real pleasure to, to uh, chat with you all. And I hope that all of the – I've been real impressed with uh, the enthusiasm that, that your supporters are – are, are out there in, in social media and out on the streets and talking to people. So keep up that good work and, and, uh, and we'll celebrate uh, later this year. Thank you so much. And John, uh, if you have any final things to um, talk about as far as uh, what's coming up in the, in the coming week as far as broadcasts, if you'd like to come on in with that, um, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, we're going to go should. out with our closing song. Should. All right, here you go. Nico, let's talk about a few of the things we got Martin up there. So uh, we've got We the People's coming up, and next week is Porsche Bolzer, and uh, we will have Nina Turner. We're still confirming that date, but we we have confirmed that she will be on the show. Uh, we've got Terrence Strait. Uh, I'm not going to remember his last name. Joffrey, what's Joffrey's last name, everybody? Young. Young, and. Uh, is it Alette? She just got added, correct? I, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just looking at the sheet here. Um, we have some wonderful We the Peoples coming up. And uh, we just booked John Fetterman. Uh, this is Alette Valentine is the uh, uh, last person on the list there. That's, that's a lot of We the People. We are out there uh, talking to the politicians that are birdiecrats, basically. They uh, feel the burn. They believe in Bernie Sanders. They believe in the 99%, just like uh, Martine Casada here. Uh, and we have to support all of these candidates. It's not just about supporting uh, Bernie. It's about supporting every candidate we have to put in office uh, if we're, if we're going to change this democracy. Bernie can't do it alone. We saw what happens when you just put a president who wants to make changes in office and don't do anything about the rest of the government that's still corrupt. Uh, it just doesn't do anything. So we had eight yeah. years of fighting. And so now we need to elect an entire government. This year it can be done. 
Next week, we'll talk to Portia Bolger. I can't wait to talk to her about that. She's one of the founders of uh, uh, Women for Bernie uh, on Twitter, and she has been an activist for most of her life, and I'm very excited to talk to her next week. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, Martin Casada, Arizona State Hi, Senator. Man. And uh, uh, one last thing, Aniko, um, who was it? We just had a contact from another Arizona State uh Representative. Now I can't think who they are. Uh, Reginald Bolding or something? Reginald yes. Bolding? Do you know Reginald? Uh, I Martin? do. He's a great guy. He's a All great right, well, guy, and you're lucky to have him. Well, we don't awesome. have him yet, so if you know him, tell him that you're Now just we have a contact. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will. Sweet. All right, guys. Martin, I so want to say personally thank you for coming on. Uh, it means everything uh, for us to have. Uh, politicians. I mean, this is an honor for us. Uh, you guys stick to MSM because that's what's out there, but you've taken the time with us today to join us on the Internet. Thank you so much, sir. Much appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, everybody else, uh, I just probably put up a shot besides here. Celeste, everybody look at Celeste real quick. You know, put up me. Um, one last thing, guys. We are cutting right from this. We're going to end right here, and we're going to go to the, uh, uh, the rest of the rally that should be going on. So we'll see you Okay, there. cool. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. A one, two. A one, two. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Give, Sanders your vote. Give, your vote. Give him your vote. Healthcare, education, clean energy. You're gonna keep this country afloat. You know he works for the people and not the billionaires. Gonna make him pay for what they broke. You gotta get, get ready for election day. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Well, healthcare is a right for all and college education too. He's a man against pollution, and he'll give us a solution on climate change. He will come through. No, he's fighting to raise the minimum wage, and his voting record's tried and true. You know he's ready to be president. Bernie Sanders is the man for you. He's busy every day as he fights for equal pay for the people all across the land. But if he's gonna win, well, we gotta all pitch in. Gotta get out and make a stand. So help him get the vote. You can donate. Get a tote. Make a song about him with your band. You gotta get ready for election day. Give Bernie Sanders a hand. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Give him your vote. Healthcare, education, clean energy are gonna keep this country afloat. You know he works for the people and not the billionaires. Gonna make them pay for what they broke. You gotta get ready for election day. Give Bernie Sanders your vote. Get ready for election day. Give Bernie Sanders, your Bernie vote. in 2016. Huge.